Welcome. Uh, this is Amanda Glassman from the Center for Global Development and apologies for the delay in our start time. Um, we're really pleased to host uh, the presentation of some interesting new research today. Um, it's connected to some work that the Center for Global Development has been following for some time. Starting in 2006, a working group led by Ruth Levine, a former senior fellow, now a non-resident fellow, and now the CEO of ID Insight. She convened together with colleagues, a working group that asked, when will we ever learn, that looked at the insufficient number of rigorous impact evaluations about what works in social policy in low and middle income countries. We're now 15 years later, and the number of impact evaluations has gone up enormously, as have other sources of evidence synthesis, like systematic reviews. Um, but we haven't had, uh, well, actually, there have been a couple of articles that sort of stop and look at how are we doing, how many. But what we haven't done as much is to assess what, uh, kind, what impact on policy are impact evaluations having? So I'm pleased that we'll have this new research that's going to look at the factors that inhibit or facilitate the use of impact evaluation findings in policy. The findings are based uh, looking at multilateral development banks, other international organizations, and then really interestingly, country case studies in Mexico, Colombia, South Africa, Uganda, and the Philippines. Um, and uh, the presenter will be Richard Manning, uh, who's a senior research associate at the Blavatnik School of Government at the University of Oxford and a non-resident fellow at CGD as well. Ian Goldman, who is an advisor on evaluation and evidence systems, clear Anglophone Africa and a professor at the University of Cape Town. And Gonzalo Hernandez Nicona, who's director of the Multidimensional Poverty Peer Network. I think the other interesting thing is that both Ian and Gonzalo have led the government agencies that were tasked with doing evaluation and use of evaluation for policy in their respective governments in the past. Um, I think, you know, there's no time like the present to talk about the need for rigorous, timely, and context-specific evidence to inform policy. As we live COVID-19, uh, billions of dollars are being mobilized for budget support, the importance of understanding which policies work to control spread, um, how we're doing in, in, in these kinds of issues is hugely important. So we'll also talk about what's the, what's the relevance of these kinds of approaches in a very rapidly evolving situation like COVID-19 and the pandemic. So viewers can submit questions during the event via YouTube or on Twitter using the hashtag CGD Talks or by emailing events at cgdev.org. So now I'll turn it over to Richard and colleagues to present the results. Uh, thank you very much, Amanda. Um, I'll just put this on screen. So uh, we're very pleased, to, the three of us, to be here today to present this uh, paper. Um, and uh, I'd like to start by thanking uh, the United Nations University wider, who commissioned it from us. Uh, and we've come up with a good number of working paper 20 of 2020. So I hope that's good, good augury. We came into this because a lot of time has passed since the report you, you mentioned, and uh, we thought it was time to say, well, what has really been achieved at the end of this? The report itself uh, said that within 10 years or so, we would either be still bemoaning the lack of knowledge about what really works, or far better able to productively use resources for development based on expanded base of evidence, and that which of those things would happen would depend very much on immediate action uh, which included, as we all know, the setting up of 3IE. Finding evidence on this is rather difficult. There's no, there's, there's really no existing study that really looks in, in a concrete way at the effective impact evaluation, though there are some important evaluations by the World Bank and the Inter-American Development Bank, which have been very useful. Uh, there is a little bit of experimental work in Brazil, which is interesting. Uh, and we therefore found ourselves mainly looking at what we could find out from existing databases by structured questionnaires to major funders, commissioners, and suppliers. And as you've already said, very importantly, by looking at this from the point of view of countries, and I'd like to take this opportunity of thanking very warmly the contributors whose names are on screen for enabling us to do that. I think these, what makes this work mostly original is these really look at it from the country's point of view, and not just from the point of view of the international development system. 
We very much hope our findings will encourage further discussion on how to make the best use of these tools. Now, unusually, I'm going to start the presentation by giving the conclusions, uh, and then we'll move into the rest of the presentation. So our conclusions in brief, undoubtedly there's been a lot of progress, as you say. Impact evaluation certainly is contributing, and we've seen some good practice, not always general practice, in improving links between researchers and policymakers. Uh, we've also found that too often there's something of a disconnect between uh, impact evaluations often done on a particular program or a particular project and the wider evidence systems and the m and &E systems of the countries themselves. I think that whether we've really been as transformational as probably those of us who are involved in the original study uh, hoped, I think is more questionable. Um, there's been a good amount of work at project level, but and there's been important conclusions on wider policy issues, but I think one might have hoped for rather more than has actually been visible over the period we're talking about. In a way that's not surprising because lower and middle income countries are faced with very complex issues, not all of them amenable to impact evaluation. And the, in any case, the pathway to policy influence from research of all sorts is seldom straightforward. And as, as we all know, countries all around the world are not immune to rhetoric about post-truth and rejection of ex experts. But I think we, we all feel that now is the time really to assess what has and hasn't worked over the last 15 years and to really try and move forward promoting these very important tools, but seeing them as part of a suite of uh, evidence tools, but also making more serious and more conscious efforts to promote use. So the way we'll organize this, I'll say, say a little bit more about what we know about what's been produced, then it'll be over to Ian to talk about use and Gonzalo to talk about where we go from here. As you've already said, there's been a very fast ramp up of impact evaluations up to about 2010. Uh, it's not clear what the latest position is, and I look forward with a great deal of interest to the next three IE report on, from their development evidence platform, which is probably the best uh, overall vehicle for this, which I believe is coming out early next year. And it'd be very interesting to see what the trends have proved to be since 2015. What we have seen is a, a gradual diversification from the health sector, which has been the pioneer in much of this, but still health, education, and social protect protection are by a long way the most important uh, sources, uh, most important sectors covered by this. But you will see that since uh, 2000, and particularly since 2010, there's been a wider spread covering quite a lot of the economy. Um, at the same time, we've seen a, a, a useful increase in uh, systematic reviews and other synthesis products. And of course, we've seen randomized control trials in particular become a staple of academic research, and it's really uh, a great tribute to those who've, who've pushed for this, that um, Abhijit Banerjee, Esther Duflo and Michael Kramer were rewarded with a Nobel Prize last year. Uh, so we've also seen so, quite a lot of evolution of the product itself. Whereas RCTs are still the main approach, uh, it's been interesting to see the creativity that researchers have used in, in natural experiments, quasar experiments and so on. Greater focus on how what, what makes a project evaluable, evaluable and the importance of getting in the early stages and looking at formative and process evaluations alongside evaluations of impact, and also development of less expensive and less time consuming ways of carrying out such evaluations while still retaining rigor. And that applies also to systematic reviews, which were, I think, largely unreadable when I first came across one, and I think have now become both more user friendly and produced more quickly. And we found that many agencies produce other kinds of evidence reviews and syntheses, and usually to sample different protocols. And I, I think what's very important are these multi-country approaches. Uh, I think JPAL's work, for example, on microcredits is a very nice example of this, where you look at the same issue across a sufficiently wide range of backgrounds to robustly draw overall lessons. And some very good analyses by academics of relevant groups of impact evaluations. And, uh, an innovation by 3IE, which has won a lot of support, is the idea of mapping where these um, impact evaluations are for different sectors. I think it's been really productive. Just, I'll just finish with this slide. Five points that, that hit me when I looked at, at impact evaluations in international development specifically. One is that impact evaluations remain very small compared to ordinary of other types of evaluation. Uh, very few bilaterals fund uh, many 
impact evaluations of their programs, uh, MCC and USA being two exceptions. Uh, even in a country like Mexico, which is a poster child of much of this, many more evaluations are carried out by Conival, uh, which are not impact evaluations. Secondly, even in relatively well-off countries, a very high proportion of um, studies are funded by the donor community. And this, uh, this is a very, from a very narrowly, narrow base. I mean, the, uh, on the official side, DFID has been by a long way the biggest supporter of some of the big programs. It's going to cease to exist in a matter of months. And it'd be very interesting to see uh, what that does to the funding for these things. And similarly on the foundation side, I should have mentioned the Hewlett Foundation as well, but there's, there's a Gates Foundation is undoubtedly by a long way the largest um, funder of these things. And uh, not only are the many of these evalu uh, evaluations funded by donors, also they're predominantly commissioned by donors or specialist intermediaries like uh, CGA, or IPA, JPAL and so on, and very often still led by a relatively small number of northern institutions, although local capacity is growing. And with that, I'll pass it on to Ian. So I'm just going to talk about the use of uh, impact evaluation and systematic review evidence and, and just to cover how we go, how do you define and assess use, what can we see about evidence of use, and what are some of the factors which, which encourage use. And uh, one of the important things we've done is to differentiate use. I think one tends to think about instrumental use as the sort of main, you know, the, the evaluation recommended this, did it happen? Uh, but, in, but in practice, what's, what's emerged in this and other work uh, we've been involved in is the, the importance of conceptual use and the, the, the building of understanding about how sectors, programs, policies are working, as well as symbolic use, the, the profile that's given. And we refer to negative symbolic use, which is policy-based evidence. But there's also a positive side where by, uh, and for example, an example in South Africa has been where an evaluation in nutrition led to much more focus on nutrition as an issue. And then process use, where the, the process of the evaluation itself leads to significant number of uh, learnings and benefits for the programs, for the, for the, for the policymakers in, the, in their process. And we give some examples of those there. So when we, um, but one of the challenges is almost no counterfactual based evidence of use. And there are few uh, in, independent evaluations that, that, that we could find of impact evaluation use. But based on what we could find, we see that there's a lot of instrumental use, program specific use, including implications for design, but unfortunately not much on how this influences planning and budget processes, which is I think one of the important areas we need to be looking at going forward. Under the conceptual symbolic, there are the high profile examples ranging from the, the famous progressor, but to microcredit and other ones, but perhaps less than one might have expected. And um, under largely process, the, we could see some examples of this and high interest that it's actually stimulating a lot of interest in, in impact evaluations and m and &E generally, and also that the, the influence on other types of evaluative work that, that arising from this. There are a number of hidden slides in the pack, and we're, we're not going through those there, but for those who download the pack, they'll, they'll see more information there. When we look at some of the specific issues related to donor funding, we can see that where this is uh, primarily targeting increased knowledge in some particular areas, this can be very positive. And I mean, some of the examples, I think from 3IE where thematic windows of funded work in, in, in particular sectors has been very, very beneficial. But there are questions when they're donor funded of what's the buy-in from other stake stakeholders. And we, there's even, uh, you know, the, the, the evidence of effective use of, of the, within the agencies is, is, is not clear. And if they're funded for domestic accountability, then the wider use seems to be more problematic. And often when they're donor funded, the links to local evidence systems is not seen as a, ma as a major priority. And this is a, this is a, a concern. When they're, the Commissioning the, on the commissioning issue, we can see that commissioning by uh, LMIC seems to help embed local ownership, uh, as well as from international policy communities. 
but there is really much more um, need for engagement of clients, uh, even when you're using some of the more developed or experienced commissioning systems. This came through quite solidly in many of our interviews. Northern lead production is, is, is problematic. Although this may lead to uh, perceptions of more rigor, having more locally led IEs is often seen to, to be more responsive to local context and have more credibility. There may be a risk, a risk of less independence and the quality is obviously important, but so is growing local capacity and a perception that the, the What's, what's coming out is really relevant to local context. There's, there is evidence of greater Southern uh, leadership um, um, in, in, in impact evaluations, but we still clearly have a long way to go. And in general, we see that there's more focus on instrumental use, but there have been examples like the thematic windows I talked about, three I thematic windows, where we see quite a lot of conceptual use emerging. And but we see less opportunities for process using in, in, in country when particularly when they're you know donor funded evaluations but there should be within donors but does not always happen uh, there are some examples of good practice engaging with policymakers, and particularly when policymakers were ready to take on a central role and for example i think tamil nadu working with jpal has been a, a, a very interesting interesting example where um they, they've worked on evaluating innovative programs, strengthening monitoring systems, and it, as well as capacity development, enhancing officials' capacity to generate and use data. And it's interesting to see how this work has been evolving to be more diverse. Also, DIME working with uh, uh, startup workshops to bring, bring policymakers and others in at early stages, 3IE and others trying to engage policymakers throughout the process some innovation in working with other stakeholders. So CIF working with journalists and, 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 and certainly my experience in government, I think there's much more we can do with, the, we need to be doing with the media. And uh, supporting implementation. Again, there've been some interesting examples uh, with JPAL on, on, on technical assistance to, to support upscaling. And also capacity building linked to, to impact evaluation. But, but as often, what we see is that what might be considered good practice is not yet generalized. And, and it's all very well looking to um, um, widen and extrapolate from individual evaluations, but context matters. So some of the key facilitators, uh, which are reflected, in, you know, which I think we'll be looking at further as we, in the, from the discussions, is about the political will, and this is a, uh, you know, really essential if, if there is going to be use. Having a government-backed m and &E or evaluation policy or strategy with dedicated funding helps, and it helps to locate the impact evaluations within an existing government system rather than be orphans. And similarly, in, when this is linked to central government functions like um, uh, in Mexico, the budget considerations report for Congress is a really interesting example where assessments of all social development programs are tabled and the budget recommendations is a very nice example. And there are a range of other ones which we mentioned there. Another factor is about transparency. And this is where the involvement of the legislature is also very important. And I'm, I'm actually writing a chapter of another book at the moment on, on looking at how you link national evaluation systems with parliament. And I think there's a lot further we need to go in that. Um, the other thing which is about ownership, and um, again, in work that's being done on evidence use, ownership from the eventual owners is really critical. And this need to be done, needs to be factored in right from before evidence is generated to the, through the evidence generation process through to the processes that happen after, after generation. And uh, this needs to be very explicitly thought about with uh, appropriate evidence use interventions used right through the process. It's also important to be able to distinguish the different users. And, and for example, one of the, before I left uh, the Department of Planning, Monitoring and Evaluation in South Africa, there was a lot of push around uh, policymakers suddenly wanting to know much more about impact. But of course, they weren't really thinking about impact evaluation and what it needed. So the importance of being able to 
to d distinguish in people's minds what is impact evaluation, what is performance monitoring, and, and, and the different roles and relevance of different tools. Another thing that emerges is, is that recommendations de uh, de uh, developed by researchers are often not very appropriate, and they need to be developed in consultation with, with stakeholders. And this is again about the, the, the process being as important as the product and trying to make sure that the stakeholders are involved at, at, at all stages through the evaluation process. Quality matters for credibility, but quality of the impact evaluation as well as the quality of the process. And I think those are two very important uh, areas. And building local centers of excellence in the production of IEs is, is, is very important so that there are real centers of expertise who know how to do this, who are local, who've got local contacts who've got good relationships, and we can talk about examples of that later. And another is that, you know, ensuring follow-up. And so having some clear system for addressing recommendations. So for example, Mexico and South Africa have improvement plans following evaluations. And this is an important system for trying to maximize the likelihood of use. So what are some of the barriers? So there's no question that impact evaluations are still much less known outside the health sector. There's a, a wariness about time and cost. Uh, there's a challenge around having sufficient baseline data. And this is linked with the fact that IEs are, are often not commissioned early enough. And uh, you know, sometimes we, 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 we get requests for impact evaluations five years after a program has started, and it's, and it's then difficult to do this. Also, when programs are complex, it's much more difficult to use an impact evaluation methodology. And the, the issue about the supply of local evaluators who are able to lead counterfactual IEs. Um, the other, another issue is around the, the, the information stakeholders actually need and being attentive to that rather than what researchers often want to find out so that IEs really are responding to policy priorities. All of us have worked in countries where evaluation is, uh, has more or less, uh, um, um, where people are more or less committed to learning. And one of the issues I think we have to be, to recognize is in, in, in many countries, learning is not a priority. And therefore the culture of, of using evaluations and, and impact evaluations in a way which Will, will really help people to move forward, requires being able to accept constructive criticism that is not always the case. And I mentioned the systems for, for institutionalization of findings, and that's obviously something that's, that's very important if you're gonna try and make findings move actually into implementation, and those systems are, are very important. So, Gonzalo. Yeah, uh, thank you, and So let me just go back, uh, to the, to the very first question that started the whole thing, the question 15 years ago of, of when will we ever learn? And of course, that question was about how can we learn about um, uh, what works in public policy, what doesn't work? That was the main question. But after 15 years, now I think that question could be also taken differently. And it's how can we learn all the stakeholders to produce and use impact evaluations and rigorous evaluation in a, in a, in a good way. Um, so, so after all these 15 years, we already have some examples of what things are working on producing and using and incentivizing uh, impact evaluation. Because it was not the case, as I mean, as, as I, I thought 15 years ago, that it was very easy. I and mean, you just produce a very good impact evaluation are very, very rigorous. And then immediately, uh, policymakers and politicians are going to take it because it's a very good work. And I think uh, the good example of Progressa perhaps made us believe that because fortunately for that example of Progressa, very good academics were in government, were policymakers and, and sometimes politicians. And therefore, they work together combining uh, the need for, for rigorous evaluations and then using it. But in general, what happens is that those two worlds are, are different. So we need to really, we are learning and we need to learn further uh, many other things about using. 
And I think it's very important for us to, 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 to take into account that impact evaluations are competing with other types of, of, uh, of, 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 of learnings that are, are, are around. And while impact evaluations take time, sometimes these are costly, sometimes don't address the right questions. Sometimes uh, we are extremely rigorous in trying to be careful about politi politicians say, well, don't, don't believe everything that, that we say in terms of this impact evaluation because there are other 15 evaluations saying something differently. While we have that, uh, we have outside very catchy narratives and sometimes the person say, well, why don't we just inject chloride? And people believe that. So we are competing with that. Uh, so sometimes the narratives from impact evaluations are not very catchy and not very attractive. Uh, therefore, we really need better communications. Um, sometimes we may think of uh, having evaluation brokers and as uh, Howard White used to say. Um, at the same time, we have to find better, where, better ways of linking our information with the political incentives of those making decisions. Uh, when we have those linkages, when, when, when we are able to say, hey, I've got this information who could be useful for you and your career. <laughs> uh, when we have that, uh, sometimes we have a lot of, um, of interest from, from uh, policy makers. So fortunately over the past 10, 15 years, we've had this exp uh, experience of, of learning more and on how to use it, how, how to incentivize. I'll give you an example. In Mexico, we have an award for remarkable impact evaluations in, in ministries. So with that award, it's another incentive of saying, well, if we produce good impact evaluations, if we use good, in, good impact evaluations, then you will, you will be rewarded publicly uh, with a very nice award. I mean, it's amazing how policymakers and politicians really react on, on, on that. So, <clears throat> um, as, as Ian was saying, we, we really need greater local ownership of impact evaluation. We have to improve countries' own efforts to produce and use good, good evidence. Uh, Country-led evaluations are important. <clears throat> It's important that scarce uh, donor funding is responsive to the priorities and concerns of countries uh, and, of course, the international community. How can we link what we think as, as um, academics are important with the priorities of, of, of that society? Um, and apparently, as uh, we, met, we showed in the, in the paper, um, there's a reduced appetite by donors to fund underlying public goods which I, I think we think it's a, it's, it's a pity because we still have many things to learn from those public goods. Um, so I think it's a good time, as Richard said, to reflect on how can we promote better evidence systems and better use of, of the systems? Uh, how can we use impact evaluation within a more comprehensive m and &E system? And if we do that, we will eventually be learning a lot. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Gonzalo, and we'll put up the paper, the paper link and, and the presentation on our website after the talk. So now let's turn to our commentators, starting, um, Richard, if you can unshare your screen. We'll turn to Marie Garter, who's the executive director of 3IE, the organization that was born of the When Will We Ever Learn working group, um, to tell us a little bit about her perspective on the issue of evidence use and IE. Um, I, I sometimes feel like we're in a pendulum swing between uh, this kind of results agenda, counting things, IE accountability, and then, you know, just spend the money, get it out the door, let's see what's going on. And obviously in the current situation where we're, we're facing some of those uh, tensions, can, can you comment on that and anything else you'd like to add in response to what you Good idea. Yes, uh, thanks very much. Um, 
And first of all, congratulations, Ian, Richard, and Gonzalo for a very important and uh, rich contribution to documenting the, documenting the state of impact ocean and, and its use. Uh, and thanks to Amanda and the CGD team for organizing this important event. Um, before making uh, three, uh, three, three specific comments, I wanted to say that I really agree with just about everything uh, that has been, you know, is in the paper and has been presented here. And I think, you know, really important insights have been derived, in particular the importance of, of measures to assure local ownership of impact evaluations and, and the processes. Um, and also the other points about the drawing on the range of evaluation and synthesis methods and tools to ensure usefulness and relevance of the evaluation undertaking in the in the local context. I thought that was really nicely brought out and uh, and very much something I agree with. So in my points, I will focus on, on three points that maybe add a little bit um, uh, some perspective to, to, to what is in the paper and maybe try to be a bit provocative to see if, if uh, that can sort of uh, get some reactions as well. Um, my first point is, you know, this issue of where are we on the, on the trajectory of production and use? And, and Amanda, you just referred to that, that as well. And in my mind, interestingly, both are very hard to find a denominator for. You know, how much evidence is enough? Is, the, is there a satiation point? Can we say now we know enough about CCTs? Um, how much use and uptake is enough? And what about the quality and, and type of use? Um, and so, um, the, the recently relaunched re 3IE development evidence portal that, that Richard also mentioned uh, in 3IE, it builds on a decade old research, resource provided by 3IE, which is um, uh, was known as the repositories. Um, and it basically provides a user-friendly searchable interface that combines impact evaluations, about 4,000 impact evaluations at the moment, uh, 720 systematic reviews and 20 evidence gap maps. So the, by far the widest, largest uh, sort of portal and database searchable portal for, um, for evidence for low and middle income country um, um, topics. Um, and, um, and I've attached um, in, the, in the chat uh, a link to, uh, to a few figures that we could just follow along once when I, when I uh, talk now. Um, because here you will see a, a few graphs that show different ways the new platform helps uh, capture and, and visualize the, ex the evidence and the existing gaps. Uh, from this, you can see that while the evidence has grown substantially, as Richard uh, showed previously, although maybe tapering off a bit, the distribution is quite uneven. And in particular, you'd see a total gap really in areas like the, uh, the West Africa and the MENA region, to give one example. Um, we also have, you will see a graph that is mapping the volume of funding, uh, Overseas Development Assistance, ODA, to availability of evidence. And um, while the health sector dominates in terms of uh, impact valuations and systematic reviews with more than 70% of the evidence in this sector, it receives only 17% of ODA. Uh, for many other sectors, um, including governance, uh, um, education, energy, transportation, ICT, and industry, the trend is uh, in the opposite direction, with a much smaller share of the evidence base relative to ODA. So then it's showing sort of a, an imbalance and, and definitely, um, you know, not, not, not uh, you know, the best, the best uh, balanced use of, of, of uh, uh, evaluation funding for, to improve policy making. Um, and for example, while 16% of ODA spending goes to government and civil society, less than 5% of impact evaluations and systematic reviews focus on this area. And then the third graph you will see is, is also very interesting and showing a huge lack and, and, and gap, and which is the, the importance of gender and equity uh, to global policy agendas, hugely acknowledged, hardly ever, uh, very rarely and badly dealt with in impact evaluations. Now, as for um, um, how much uptake is enough, as mentioned in the study as well, 3IE has a very advanced process to, uh, for ensuring evidence uptake, or at least pushing it forward. Uh, we are also tracking the studies supported by 3IE for eight types of uptake. You'll see the last figure to see the type typology. 
and this can everything from taking successful programs to scale through to informing global policy discussions. Um, and we are using what contribution contribution tracing to um, to verify that uh, if it is indeed our supported studies that actually led to uh, any identified use. But one issue not captured well uh, and hard to capture is delayed use, especially if there is uh, often there is no financing um, uh, for capturing this. Very often the, the donor financing etc will sort of finish once the once the project closes. Uh, and, and so the, the funding uh, uh, for, for capturing use is, is often not there. Another issue is that many, issue, uh, many studies only find um, their use, um, and, I, and I would argue maybe the best use, as, as also Richard, I think, alluded to, through systematic reviews, which again come at the later stage and, uh, and does not you know, loop back to the individual studies in terms of, of crediting them for, for later use. But back to the question, what is, uh, would be the ideal amount of use and uptake? Um, and, um, and, and we think, and I think that much more could be done in terms of identifying what would be reasonable use, you know, during the process before you actually finish the process, the products and, and thinking about it from the outset and then see whether, whether that identified potential is actually realized as opposed to just counting whatever happened uh, afterwards. My second point, it will be shorter, uh, is that, uh, and where I hope to, to get some juices going, a lot of impact relations are not designed and have not been designed and of a quality that they necessarily should inform use. Um, and I think this is sometimes maybe the elephant in the room. We should be careful about drawing conclusions and making recommendations unless, you know, we have cost information coming together with the estimates of effectiveness. Uh, unless we have good implementation information, um, preferably also um, outcome measurements over time, so we see how things are changing over time, and importantly, also looking at unintended effects and subgroup analysis. And I would suggest that many researchers are uh, as well are aware aware of this and are hence not comfortable going, you know, all out in terms of uh, in terms of sort of trying to ensure uptake. Uh, give, let me give you just a concrete example of what I mean. Let's say that we have a new COVID vaccine that is cheaper than all other vaccines. It is effective in the long run. Um, it's easy to administer with no side effects. Then I think the researchers involved would be quite willing and happy to go all out uh, in terms of ensuring that this is being developed, uh, distributed, communicated, etc. everything to, to ensure uptake. But most of, I, most of the IEs do not look at, en at any of these issues, only whether it increases immunity compared to no vaccine, or maybe sometimes compared to another, but very seldom costs, never looking or very seldom over time, and very seldom looking at ease of administration. Um, my third and final point right now is uh, that you talked a bit about, um, and the study mentions the issue of risks of skewing evaluations towards positive findings of donor-supported programs. Um, and I have experienced that it is the reality for anyone with a, with a vested in, interest in an evaluation, be it a funder or uh, a, a country government, um, to, to, to have sort of, to, to, to lead to this kind of, of um, potential pressure and, and, and vested interest. Um, and pressure does not have to be exerted explicitly through withholding funds, but it often could be sort of through questioning the methods or maybe even through self-censorship by the researchers. Um, and so I would say that I think in three, you know, and, and we in 3 ae we have played a specialized role as a quality assurer and independent arbitrators of sorts in many evidence programs. And I believe this kind of role in some shape or form is still needed. Um, this tendency has been lately in several agencies um, to, uh, towards managing these programs uh, themselves. And I'm worried uh, about what this will do to the quality and objectivity of the evidence. Uh, we have had researchers come to us seeking our help and, and collaboration in order to sort of help manage the pressure that, that they uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes feel. Um, finally, on this point, um, I think this is where in our new development evidence portal, uh, we are also coding 
in addition to funders, we're also coding for outcomes and interventions. So very soon we will be able to also see whether there are any tendencies that certain funders, for example, tend to have more positive findings and outcomes than others, or whether there are differences between funders and governments. So there's sort of things to explore there in terms of these kind of, of biases. Um, yeah. So let, let me stop there and over to you, Amanda. Okay, thanks very much, Marie, and thanks uh, for providing the link to some of the slides that I think will be really useful. I mean, as you say, a lot of these, you know, talking about uptake and use is inevitably a kind of qualitative uh, undertaking, um, and the window of opportunity for influence may be multiple years. And I really like the point that you're making about, um, you know, many times studies are not designed very well to inform policy in the real world. Um, but I guess the question is, should we be moving more systematically towards the kinds of evaluations that would be uh, relevant in the real world, including cost and time and unintended effects, implementation, et cetera. Um, so great, great points. So now let's turn to um, Anne Kabagambe. She's the executive director of the Africa Group One constituency at the World Bank Group. So you have the big picture, um, both working in government as well as uh, from the World Bank, which, which obviously funds and is very active in, in the area of impact evaluation and evidence. So over to you, Anne. Yeah. <clears throat> Good morning and thank you, Amanda, and uh, greetings to my fellow panelists and also to the audience. So to contextualize these remarks, I, I will go back to what Amanda has said that while I speak as a member of the World Bank Group Board, I also represent a group of African countries who are also clients of the bank. So that's why I, I really appreciate this opportunity to discuss this subject from the point of view of the work of the institutions, but also how they can benefit the decision-making process of the countries that I represent. So to me, what this report really highlighted was the fact that the business of development for us as institutions, as governments, as academics that we have seen and other stakeholders is basically a means to an end and that to be able to understand the effectiveness of achieving that end, we need to go back to some tools like evaluations to really know the outcome of our impact and, and therefore the good that we might be doing. And this is where I believe that I would want to acknowledge how far we have come in this exercise uh, from the 2006 report, which was referred to, uh, in which uh, the most important quote I remember was the rising impatience with ignorance due to the lack of impact evaluation to today's excellent presentation. So there really is reason for optimism on this subject. So let me begin with a positive message that was brought out in the report on the numbers of impact evaluations, which have been significantly rising. Both uh, Ian and Gonzalez referred to the subject in their opening remarks of these being fully funded or commissioned mainly by external agencies. And, and of course, Gonzalez talked about some of the diminishing funding. But what does this really mean in view of the tendency to tilt these evaluations towards the needs of the funding agencies, even as the resources are diminishing? Needless to say that uh, there will always be a weakness in a system that might serve policy concerns of, of our financing agencies. And there is a possibility and a likelihood of a one-way dialogue, if this is in fact the case, so that the 
influencing policy dialogue that was referred to will be less diminished. Uh, my second point is that I wanted to share the view that the impact of programs as was referred to in the report uh, should be based on uh, reliable and accessible, if I may say, data, uh, regular monitoring, and of course commitment to promoting uh, the use of the results on evidence. I believe that if we should be successful in this endeavor, we must continue to ponder the question of who actually is the direct beneficiary? Is it the client in their effort to improve on decision making? And if so, why does the report say that uh, impact evaluation has not really penetrated to country level? So there are many reasons. Uh, my experience uh, as, as actually a board committee member of a, a, a committee that directly oversees the independent evaluation group, which does impact evaluation for the World Bank, uh, is that we cannot underestimate the role of synchronizing these impact evaluation exercises and the importance of coordinating on time as the critical measures um, and that um, the some of the reasons uh, in the report on the lack of commitment, uh, whether political or otherwise, and whether the results of the evaluations were being used to resource allocation to countries, sometimes cannot uh, apply when in fact, as an example, if we, uh, and, and I, I want to refer to country partnership frameworks for, for those in the audience who are familiar with some of the products that the, the World Bank Group and other institutions use to make decisions and to provide um, analysis is not uh, a product that is synchronized in our case at the World Bank with the studies on impact evaluation work. So in fact, some of this work relies on short-term reviews of country diagnostics or sector diagnostics. So the evaluation impact work comes much later. I think that was referred to in the report. So therefore it did not come as a surprise to me that the report found that some of the World Bank Group evaluations which are supposed to provide evidence of impact is to, and I'll quote the report, modest and sporadic and not directly associated with the actions of the countries concerned. So it would appear to me that uh, these evaluations are designed to mainly trigger collective actions for management without directly informing or influencing the decisions of some of my client countries. And these processes will need to be inclusive and possibly widely shared and systematically brought to the relevance of the clients so that they can make informed decisions. Indeed, as was noted in the report, impact evaluation must be embedded within our government structures. So I guess, Amanda, my message is that we cannot separate impact evaluation from the entire development enterprise. Commitment of all of us actors 
both the academics, the financiers, the recipients, uh, and the audience is going to be key in transforming our economies. And that's why I believe that a uh, hundred percent commitment should be expected if the impact is to be felt by the client countries. And I want to leave you with one question. Um, and that is that, um, would it be possible to look at impact evaluation from, from a holistic perspective that would be more systematic within our own national development enterprise? I'll stop here, Amanda, thank you. Thanks very much, Anne. And um, I really share your take on the country partnership frameworks. If you look at them, there's the checkbox paragraph on monitoring and evaluation it does not refer to the policy priorities. It doesn't talk about the specific arrangements for evaluation. It just says we'll track implementation regularly. So of course there's variability across countries, but um, I think your points are really well taken and as well as the issue of being embedded into a government structure, which is a very good segue to our next speaker, who's Timothy Lubanga, who is the commissioner for monitoring and evaluation embedded in the office of the prime minister in Uganda. So Timothy, to you, you're muted. Sorry. Thank you, Amanda, and thanks to uh, Richard, uh, Ian, and Gonzalo for the beautiful pre presentation. And uh, greetings to all the panelists and all the participants. Amanda, I realize that you are running out of time, so uh, I'll be very brief. And um, the first comment I want to make is um, just three quick things that I picked out of uh, the presentation. First is a, a very serious uh, law uh, investment in evaluations on infrastructure, energy, um, works and transport and so on. And that's a real issue for us here as well because um, that's where the budget uh, is concentrated. That's where the national resources are prioritized. And so we are faced with um, an issue where the biggest um, uh, uh, areas that the, bu the budget uh, preoccupies are uh, not evaluated. And we are beginning to think um, more creatively on how we can actually start doing some evaluations in that area. The second is um, the issue that uh, Ian raised about influencing the planning process. Um, the biggest um, benefit or effect that we would want to see is the evaluation influencing the budgeting and planning processes in government. Um, and that is a big, big dilemma, a big challenge, uh, and which we are grappling with. And I really like the findings uh, of the study on that. And finally, what Gonzalo mentioned around the importance of better communication, especially between scientists and the politicians. And um, during the COVID uh, response period here, that has been a real issue to the extent that uh, some of the um, advice that is provided by the scientists is not really um, uh, informing the political uh, message that is going out there. And even when it is informing, there is a lot of how best can this be improved and so on. So I thought those three are, are quite striking for me in the paper. And I will go straight to the to the, to the question that uh, Amanda, you asked me to comment on. And that is the, the question of the political will. Um, so in our experience, in my own experience here, I think to a large extent, it is the responsibility of who you who generates the evidence to actually tickle and arouse this political will. It doesn't come by chance, it doesn't come uh, automatically. And one of the strategies that we find effective here is let the evaluation respond to the real information gap or the real question that the political um, environment wants answers for. In that way, 
you get political interest from the word go. So many times, um, I think the paper also highlighted uh, the evaluation is informed by questions that originate from elsewhere and not really related to the actual needs of the of the policymakers and the political class. And, and yet they have the real demands. In every cabinet meeting, there are questions as to whether this policy, is this policy working? Is that law performing? Is this the right policy? Is this the right approach? In parliament, almost every parliamentary session has questions where parliament is challenging government. And that is where the questions for evaluation should be derived from. Not from um, our wishful, ambitious thoughts or our academic interests and so on. So that is one, in one way that you can effectively, in my view, um, arouse and generate political interest. The other is um, you need to use the right strategy. Um, you can generate as much evidence as you like and very good evidence from evaluations. But what strategy do you use to actually reach out to the right people who should do, who should use and who should own, who should create the influence? Um, in the evaluation field, we, we promote the use of champions. That is very effective. But which champion? Who should be this champion? How do you, how do you um, find the right champion? How do you empower that champion to do it? How do you get the champion to deliver the message well? What are the structures you use? I think that is an important consideration um, that, um, that we have to make. And uh, the third point is around, again, the communication strategy, the communication mechanisms that we use. Um, this is a big, big issue with the policymakers. And even the question of the linkage between the evidence generators and the political and the, the policymaker is hugely around a poor communication channel, a, break, a, a, a lack of effective mechanism for communicating what should reach out to the um, to the um, to the policymaker. And finally. Um, uh, this, again, this has been raised um, before quite a number of times, that impact evaluations uh, have a cost. In many cases, they take a long time. Uh, and uh, we have challenges of data, lack of baseline data, and so on. I think going forward, we need to really think about how to do these evaluations quickly and respond when the information is required respond to the need at the right time. Many times we, we do a great job, undertake an evaluation, provide the evidence, very, very well received, but it comes too late when a decision has already been made. And so um, I think going forward, I know the advancement in technology, the use of big data and so on has now enabled um, data collection and surveys to be done more quickly and uh, cheaper but we still need to know how we can do these things better and faster. I think, Amanda, in the interest of time, I would like to stop there and uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Timothy. I think uh, your points are all excellent. And the last one that you've made, I hope that we'll spend the next uh, several months looking at that here from CGD, sort of looking at what the field's doing. And one of the key leaders in this field, I think, is Divya Nair, who's our next commentator. She's a director based in Delhi for ID Insight. Um, and you have been involved in some of this kind of real-time impact evaluation, A-B testing. Uh, others have as well. But I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about your perspectives on these issues and, and also the work that you're doing currently related to COVID-19, which goes a bit into this issue of um, you know, what can we do that's quick that would, that enables us to inform policy in real time? Thanks, Divya. Sure, thanks, Amanda. And, uh, you know, th uh, thanks, uh, Ian, Richard, and Gonzalo for a really interesting uh, report. Uh, really, you know, it, it's very heartening to see the progress that has been made over time in terms of uh, use of evaluations. Um, what I found, um, I'd like to frame the conversation around the culture of use of, uh, of evidence. 
Um, and I really found uh, your focus on the measurement piece in terms of basically, you know, the continuum of how data can be used or evidence can be used, very useful and interesting because we spend a lot of time within ID Insight kind of thinking about, you know, what is, what is the best way to get policymakers to, you know, perform evidence-based decision-making. And so kind of getting that sense of, you know, this, this continuum is really uh, useful. Um, but I do have a lot of questions uh, after reading the report too, and I can start with that and then talk a little bit about our own experience in terms of how we have handled uh, this continuum. So one of the, uh, you know, the Carnival example, and since Gonzalo is here, uh, is really uh, compelling. And uh, I would say that, you know, that would be kind of the ideal situation for many of us to be uh, where the government is leading and owning um, the evidence space in many ways and is allocating budgets according to, you know, what's working and what's not working, uh, where there is this culture of, you know, self-criticism perhaps of, uh, transparency, ownership, political will, all these words that have come up today. And, you know, the question is, how has that happened in Mexico? And, you know, why is it not happening in other countries? Uh, how do you make it happen? And, uh, you know, the, we all have some answers here, but I, I would say that that's the hard part. And kind of uh, learning a little bit from you on what really what does it really take to make to set up institutions like this uh, that you know basically can kind of survive different political leaderships and uh, you know movements of bureaucrats etc that would be i would say the the secret source here that that we've kind of skirted around um, in terms of uh, how we have approached this and i uh, i'm happy to talk a little bit about that is uh, you know Impact evaluation is kind of one tool within this toolkit of, that exists. And uh, I think that was something, again, uh, you do mention it quite a lot in, your, uh, in the report, but I still think that the focus is potentially too much on impact evaluations. And uh, there needs to be kind of a step back in terms of what do policymakers really need, like putting, them, putting ourselves in their shoes uh, basically, they don't, you know, they're making decisions all the time. They're making them in real time. They're making them, you know, it's not one decision that that is being made. And so being present, being embedded, being kind of um, responsive to their questions kind of builds that culture of evidence that is often lacking. And so uh, what we have seen is that, uh, you know, for example, providing uh, data, whether we have this data on demand system, for example, where we've been collecting data in India every six months for the central government uh, from around 30,000 households across the country. And then this data is used by a key ministry to kind of in, to get a pulse of what's happening um, across the population. So that kind of forms a platform for what, you know, what's happening um, and gives the government a sense of, you know, progress and, uh, uh, and change. But for example, now in the context of COVID, we were able to leverage the uh, this kind of pre-COVID information to then collect additional information on how, what is, you know, the situation currently uh, for these households. And because uh, you know we prioritize being responsive, being quick, rigorous, we were able to collect uh, information ten days into the you know lock, national lockdown that happened. So we were able to provide data to uh, to the government on what the situation was in terms of relief uh, that that was being received in terms of uh, you know knowledge of COVID practices and uh, symptoms and all of that. So. Uh, you know, basically what my main kind of take, take away from this is how do you make sure that there's that kind of platform, that kind of openness to evidence and then willingness to use uh, uh, various toolkits. Uh, uh, you know, that happens only if you're in constant touch with uh, the part, uh, partners. And as Timothy was saying is that, you know, the, 
ask needs to come from the government. It cannot be uh, kind of ex post in many ways, which is what happens in the in many situations. So that was one major point that I want to make is that, you know, having this relationship, being responsive, being quick uh, in the context of COVID and pre-COVID is, is essential. The second is uh, measurement and incentives uh, in terms of how you uh, measure use. So uh, basically for within our organization in terms of ID Insight, we are very conscious of uh, measuring, uh, you know, what decisions influenced. So um, have we been able to influence decisions by the actions that we take, the projects that we engage on? We're constantly keeping a pulse on that. Uh, but uh, it, it is something that uh, Marie was also talking about is that it's a messy process. It often happens far out into uh, after a program is uh, completed, et cetera. So having that kind of patience, having budgets that are allocated, you know, post project completion to, one is to disseminate, to follow up, to uh, share these findings uh, is very important. And that's something that I feel a lot of uh, organizations don't do much of. And uh, it is an area that really needs to be prioritized uh, going forward if data use is uh, critical. And finally, my last point is just in terms of capacity and uh, you know, when you're building this culture of data use, uh, it is essential to kind of, um, you know, think about how to um, improve the culture, of, uh, the capacity. And this is something that we've all probably been thinking about, but it, there hasn't been much evaluation about uh, on capacity building related to evaluations. So, uh, you know, do people know how to interpret uh, the evidence that's coming in? Are they, are they then kind of uh, assimilating, digesting it and all of that? Uh, there's not much evidence on that. So I'll stop here. Okay, thanks so much, Debbie. I think, yes, we, we don't have a very rigorous way of assessing, you know, what's the difference between a state in India implementing a similar policy, uh, one that uses concurrent and iterative impact evaluation and the other that's going with intuition and gut trial and error, you know, not trial, but just uh, uh, what is it that... Um, sort of finding the way uh, from a, in a more intuitive sense. So we're not there yet. We haven't done that. I mean, if you look at some of the evaluations in health on performance-based funding, there are some of these kinds of evaluations, you know? So I wonder, do we have to prove that or can we just all accept that it's probably better to use data and evidence to make policy <laughs> versus uh, traveling in the dark? And I mean, there's been a lot of discussions around flying blind and in, in COVID-19 that I think make the point well enough. Um, so thank, thanks to all of you for taking time out of your very busy schedules. This is a, a wonderfully uh, representative global panel. Maybe I'll just ask in the last two minutes, I'll go back to our authors if you wanted to say one last thing about how you hope your report would be used by the international community in terms of next steps. Uh, Richard or Ian or Gonzalo, who I gets think, the last word? I think we should listen very carefully to what our colleagues and friends in the lower and middle income countries are saying. And I think we've got to prioritize the needs of the policymaker and to fit the research to do that and align somehow, and this is difficult to do, the incentives of the policymaker and the incentives of the researcher. Exactly. Okay. Well, uh, Ian, do you have any last comments? I see you. I mean, I, I think just, uh, and I, I think the work I've just been doing recently on evidence use in Africa, I think that it's very important that we are conscious and very deliberate in trying to get evidence used, whether it's from impact evaluation or as Lydia was saying, these other different sources as well. And we need to think very carefully about what we're going to do to make that happen before, during, and after any evidence generation process. Intentionality. Gonzalo, last word. Well, I think Coneval, the experience of Coneval was brought up by Divya and very well documented in the paper. But we have to say that um, recent events in Mexico indicate a sort of weakening of the use of Coneval. I don't know if you can say anything about that as part of your final, that it's a, it's an ongoing need to advocate for evidence uh, use and policy and evaluation. What what do you think? No, uh, certainly, Amanda and Divya, 
that the carnival experience is very interesting. Um, and it, is, it doesn't mean that everything always goes up all the time. Uh, in Mexican case, it was not the government who asked for, for Carnival, it was Congress. And the reason Congress asked for that was for accountability. They want to make the president accountable. And um, however, that perhaps good practice, um, it, it's, it's, it, it was very good for Mexico, but for Colombia and for Chile and for South Africa with different institutions, the, the idea of having uh, good processes should come from different um, sources and different institutions. So I think the ideal thing is how can we improve country-led evaluations according to the institutions and history uh, and incentives of every country? I think that's a very, very important um, key element. Well, thanks so much. Marie, last comment. Sorry, it was just one quick comment because it, it was also um, something that I thought should uh, should have mentioned earlier, but but it may be worth mentioning also the COVID related um, uh, you know moment is that there's a lot of buzz and lots going on right now in terms of extracting from existing evidence. And we're having you know we're piloting help desks, desks of uh, and rapid response services, extracting that. And I think even though the COVID related you know situ situation is sort of different, I think there are lessons that you know the judgment of good evaluators, etc., can extract from existing systematic reviews, existing impact evaluations, and package and make relevant. And we sort of we're piloting that. We've seen Macquarie University, Africa Center for Evidence. These are the kind of things that are, I think. Um, you know, just just worth mentioning that I think, you know, even and it's not only the policymakers are not necessarily good enough at using evidence, researchers are not good at using existing evidence. So just uh, wanted to make a, a, a pitch for that as well before handing back yeah. to you. Yes, e even on something as wearing a mask, uh, <laughs> one could, yeah. Okay, we'll stop there. Thank you so much to all of you for your time spent and for the late nights. Uh, uh, for uh, Divya and uh, later in the day for Ian and Timothy. Uh, thank, thanks so much. And we'll see you next time for more. Thanks. Thank you, Amanda.